Hi, my name is Andreas Hense and this video is part of a series on business process automation. Today I have the great pleasure to have Arthur Ter Hofstetter as an interview guest. Arthur is a Dutch computer scientist and a professor of information systems at the Queensland University of Technology in Australia. He is one of the most influential scientists in business process management and is famous for his work on workflow patterns. Arthur is one of the fathers of YAL. YAL stands for yet another workflow language and is an open source business process management system. Okay, yes, so Arthur, I'm really happy uh, to have you here um, in the interview. Um, and so this is um, my first intercontinental interview. You are there in the afternoon, I'm here in the morning, but the sun is already there, so it's very nice. And yeah, I would I'd like to ask you some fundamental questions about YAL, yet another workflow language. And um, the first question is, of course, I mean, how, how did this all um, come up. I mean, um, I understand that there has been uh, the Workflow Patterns Initiative and that YAL is a result um, of that. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct, Andreas, and, and thank you for having me. Um, um, well, there's a few origins, in a way, I, uh, to, to, the, to the YAL uh, uh, language. I remember that when we were working on the workflow patterns that a colleague at QUT, Paul Rowe, asked us about a pattern language. And I, did, I didn't really see the significance initially of that, but of course YAL can be seen as such. Um, there was also a reviewer of uh, the workflow patterns paper that, uh, that literally said, I do not think that such complex patterns can be used in real life workflow systems. Uh, so in a way, you can also see YAL as an answer to that criticism. And um, we also had a, a grant application um, where we proposed YAL as a like a kind of an, uh, an intermediate language that allows you to translate between different process modeling languages. So in, in that context, I mean, there were many more pro process modeling languages around then than now. Um, so YAL as an intermediate language, what the idea would be is that instead of having all these um, uh, mappings between these languages, that these mappings would go through the YAL language and that it does needed to be a very powerful uh, a powerful into uh, yeah powerful language the, the your language then emerged from um, the workflow patterns uh, and, and 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 work workflow nets of course that uh, will van der Haals had, had proposed so the idea is that the the your language then um, uh, uh, incorporated, if you like, workflow nets, but added capabilities to deal with some of the of the workflow patterns that workflow nets could not deal so directly with. Ah, okay. So, um, who came up with the name? I mean, yet another is a long tradition in computer science. I know uh, yet another compiler compiler, for example. Who who, who coined the, na the name YAL? Yet another workflow language. Yeah, so I, I, I had forgotten it, so I, I asked Will van der Aast and, and he came up with the name. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, the idea of having, um, I mean, of course, um, a proof of concept of all these uh, complex workflow patterns, I think that's, that's a, a very valid point because, you know, reading them, I mean, yeah, you, you can easily find that it's completely, you know, uh, unfeasible to, to, to have these. And this, so, so your is the proof that it is. I mean, I think, I think that's, that's a very good point. The other thing is um, translating between different modeling languages. I mean, that's a very, uh, you know, uh, complex topic. And I've seen that in Apromoro, for example, there has been this idea of having this intermediate language. And then, um, um, but, but the problem is, I think that if you translate between two languages and you have a third in the middle, I mean, you're losing expressivity twice. Don't you think that's a problem? So the idea, you, of course, you can lose that if your intermediate language is not powerful enough. Um, so I, I guess our proposition was that we would make you all very powerful so that it, we, we wouldn't lose uh, things in the translation, at least as an ambitious, ambitious goal. Mm -hmm. Okay, because it covers more than 90 or 95 percent of all the patterns. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, if you look at the time when you all was... Um, um, was created, um, what do you think were the main differences 
um, in, com in the computer science wor world uh, at that time and now? I mean, do you think do you think it was a di different world then than it is now? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. It's you can answer it in different ways. I mean, there were different, um, of course, um, there was a different approach to. Um, to process modeling, for example, you had the Workflow Management Coalition at that time that had uh, proposed uh, a language, uh, XPDL, um, that was ba that was m more or less the intersection of a number of other languages. So it was a the idea was that process modeling, if you ask me, the idea was that it shouldn't be too shouldn't offer too too complicated concepts and that. Uh, uh, and, and thus it, it was a fairly minimal uh, language in its first, uh, in the first instance. Um, but of course the, dis the, the disadvantages as we know now is that process modeling has complexities to it. You may not always have to use advanced modeling concepts, but from time to time you, you do. Um, so that approach did not really succeed. Um, and there were many, uh, many tools that had their own languages, and there were uh, also many academic, yeah, a number of academic approaches uh, to process modeling. And the problem is, of course, yeah, interoperability, uh, in, in a way, a problem that we just talked about. Um, yeah, how how do concepts in one language or, or theoretical results in one language how do they translate to another language? Um, so having this plethora of languages was fairly typical for the time. At the time, there was no consensus around what the concept should be, and uh, and and thus what a what an appropriate language should be. And and of course, if you choose a particular paradigm, then you just can't add certain concepts so easily. You have to think about how you add it to that paradigm. So you can talk to a vendor and it goes, oh well, we can add it to the next edition or so. But that 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 is not necessarily so easy given the paradigm that they've chosen. We in more theoretical work, we showed there were a number of different different paradigms, for example. And so that was a, a, a difference. This this almost wild growth of different programming, uh, sorry, different process modeling languages. Um, technologically, I would say we are much more advanced now in things, so, so in terms of screen generation or, or, uh, and these sorts of things. I remember that it took us quite a while before we had our first sol solution working around uh, the automatic generation uh, from XML of, of screens. For yeah, typically you want to have that for prototyping purposes, right? Um, at that time, yeah, it, it, we relied on other technology that was yeah that was fairly new or not not fully developed yet. Um, so that was uh, that was also a challenge. I'd say um, yeah, some of these things that are now easier to do, or technologically speaking, were, were a bit harder then. So we had, uh, in a way, conceptual breakthroughs through the workflow patterns where we understood what a language needs to have, we understood the, understood the capabilities, and we had some con technological breakthroughs where we could realize some of these things. Okay, yeah. Um, what, what is the relationship to, uh, to BPMN, uh, to Business Process Model and Notation? I, I think it goes some, some, something goes in the same direction, but some things differ. What, what's your view on that? Yeah, the, it, it's, uh, yeah so BPMN, uh, 2.0, I would say, and uh, given the references that it makes to the workflow patterns, is also influenced by that work, by the workflow patterns work. But it has a bit of a different philosophy. And at the end of the day, both YOL and BPMN recognize that you need to have uh, a, a comprehensive support for the workflow patterns. So um, that's what they share. The way they go about it is a bit different. Um, BPMN, if you look at the number of, 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 of symbols, concepts, is a, is, that's a fairly big, big number. Many, many graphical uh, uh, symbols, for example, uh, you will find in BPMN 2.0. And YOL has chosen a more minimalistic approach. It's taken uh, basically based on workflow nets, which themselves are based on Petri nets. And then, looked, and then we looked for uh, minimal extensions to the workflow nets in order to realize the control flow patterns. And I would say um, that is a difference. Oh, okay. I was just thinking about the OR join. You, you talked about complex um, complex pattern, uh, patterns, and the OR join, um, from from my point of view, is something 
um, that hadn't been considered before that there was a problem. I remember uh, all this modeling, for example, in, in EPCs, in the RS tool set, you had, you had this OR join in there, but no one, no one was thinking that this, this was a problem. And then um, when you try to automate things, you, 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 you come to the conclusion that it's something special. And we had recently um, this um, event that we had in a real, you know, in a real project, we had a real problem with the OR join that the your engine wasn't responsive because it was just calculating a long time. So what's your view on, on these things like the OR join or maybe there are other concepts that are critical? Uh, so the OR join is, is a good example and, and different notations had OR joins but not necessarily the same interpretation of that concept. So maybe in the most straightforward cases you could say ah, they are fairly similar but, but in the general case it could look quite different. Um, well, first of all, Will van der Aalst, I think, was the first to, to, to formalize EPCs and to note uh, the idea, to, together with Eckhart Kindler, I think, they looked at the idea of uh, Vicat, uh, sorry, vicious uh, circles uh, in EPCs. So they, they, they showed a fundamental problem in the realization of, uh, of all joints in EPCs. So that was quite interesting and perhaps a kind of a, a first realization that that concept is, yeah, is not, not, not straightforward. And, and has some has some inherent almost contradictions, if you like. Um, then we also saw in tools. I remember we had a demonstration of a tool at one stage that I happened to be in the Netherlands. Will and I went to a, a tool a tool vendor, and we saw um, we asked questions about a particular execution scenario using an OR join. And the simple scenarios, of course, you have an OR split followed by a corresponding OR join, and. Um, yeah, that works generally quite well. So if you know, uh, in this case, if you keep it structured, then if you know how many branches were started, you know how many branches you needed to wait for. But then we asked uh, the person who was giving us the demonstration to basically allow one of these paths that was started to exit this block, this or split or join block. And yeah, then the tool deadlocks uh, because it keeps waiting for that thread that has chosen to go a different way. That already shows yeah, some of the complexities of that concept. In the PhD thesis of, uh, of Mo Win, uh, with and also with Will van der Aalst and David Edmund, then we looked further at what, uh, what, the, what the or join, um, what it could, could be in YAWL. Um, and that turns out, uh, yeah, that was, that was uh, yeah, it's quite a bit of effort to formalize that and to, and to implement that. And as you say, you're correct that in some cases, um, it can be the, the computational price that you pay for it can be quite high because you have to basically, simply, simply speaking, you have to look at future states. Every time you have to look at the or join it, when it is triggered to see, is it possible that further tokens can come? And for that, you have to do a, a kind of a state space analysis. And while you can use techniques like reduction techniques, etc., cetera, to, uh, to, re to, to, to simplify the complexity of that, inherently, it remains a, a difficult problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially if you have two or joints, you know, following each other, then it, ca it can become, you know, there can be some kind of combinatoric explosion, I guess. And then um, yes. it, it, it becomes very, very complex. The other um, um, interesting feature is, um, of course, uh, our cancellation regions. I also think that cancellation regions are very important, um, uh, you know, um, and, um, but, but they, they, they get you out of the domain of, of Petrinets. So um, I, I think semantically, I mean, this isn't, isn't that a problem in, in many ways? Yeah, it is. Um, you, you're, comp you're right, and and we did go th to the the theory of reset nets in in, in the thesis of Mo Win here, uh, and we had to resort to that kind of theory you, you, because they reset nets have a um, a reset arc, an arc that has the capability that upon the firing of a transition it removes all the tokens from a particular place, and reachability is no longer uh, computable anymore in the reset, uh, in the reset net, while well, it is in a Petri net. Um, but coverability still is. And coverability was what we needed for, uh, for uh, the or join. We needed to see, can a place still be covered by a token? Because then you have to wait for it. So reachability was luckily not needed, but coverability was. So we managed to, ju to just stay within the boundaries of decidability, if you like. Okay, ah, I see. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that there was some kind of um, you know, that this was um, related, these two things were related. Um, yeah, so who, um, who were the 
early adopters of the YAWL language? Who was using it first? If you go to early industrial uh, collaborations, we had a collaboration with the Intercontinental Hot Hotels Group. Um, they that we, we worked with them for a little while. Uh, we had a, I would say, a longer uh, collaboration with First Utility in the United Kingdom. I, I estimate that to be around around four years. So they used the um, the YOL environment in in practice. And um, and we learned a lot from that. We had regular phone uh, phone interactions with them. I also visited them on one occasion. So uh, the whole idea of um, to use attributes to generate screens in a particular way that came from them. Um, um, to be interested in uh, the interest in the cost perspective and uh, also came from them. Uh, and that we later successfully applied for a grant in that area. So, um, and when we had, of course, you can learn about uh, what's the performance of this environment in a real life setting. So we learned uh, a lot through that collaboration. So that was, I would say, in terms of industrial collaboration, First Utility uh, in the early phases was a very important collaborator for us. I see. So, so many of the features that are in your effectively come from co collaboration with industry or uh, from from real. Uh, um, uh, uses of the system, is that correct? I mean, uh yeah, sometimes they, they are influenced by that, yes. And, um, and you can imagine something like uh, persistence, for example, right? Um, academically speaking, that is not a super interesting research problem. But if your engine doesn't support it, you, you, you basically can't use it. Um, so also industrial collaboration has helped there. Ah, okay. Yeah, I know that the YAWL engine is very stable and the persistence is, you know, working perfectly. So that's that's one of the strong points of the system. And uh, yeah, um, the other thing, um, I, I've seen this um, project in the healthcare domain um, by uh, Jan Christian Kuhr, uh, you know, where um, I think there were there were timetables and things like that. Uh, they, they are now also part of our resources and, 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 and timetables or uh, calendars. Uh, I think are now in the YAWL system because of that. Correct. Yeah, that's what that's true. It, uh, that was a project um, that looked at scheduling of of, of operating theatres in hospital, and and indeed it had it it, it added to um, um, uh, scheduling capabilities uh, ca and calendar capabilities, I should say, and. Um, and also uh, a richer notion, ultimately, I think it was also a bit influenced by that of, of what re of resources. So not just the primary resource doing the work, but additional resources that may be needed, whether they are human or non-human. That was also, uh, I think, uh, influenced by that. Okay. Um, there's also this extension of, um, you know, for flexibility where there are um, worklets and exlets. I mean, did that also have some kind of practical uh, motivation or did that come from academia or from, from, you know, these case management ideas? Where did that come from? So that was, an, um, so that was the work of, of, of Michael Adam in, his, in the context of his PhD thesis. And there had been quite a bit of work done in the area of, of flexibility. I, I know and certainly in academia there was quite a, a bit of interest in flexibility. I would add that probably in practice, although it's harder for me to comment on that, I'm trying to remember exactly the, the practical settings at that time, but uh, certainly in academia there was a lot of interest and ultimately I mean, if you go beyond standard workflows, you, you will quickly need facilities for flexibility, right? And, and these facilities could take a different form. Um, they could take the form of, for example, uh, uh, workflows that are not over-specified. So the idea of declarative workflows, uh, the work that Maya Pesic in her thesis worked on, that, that is an example of flexibility. But Michael Adams worked on, as you say, on worklets and exlets. And um, yeah, the idea is that as, as you keep doing workflows over time, you may, you may encounter situations that you have not seen before. And you uh, basically, you see that people do them differently than the way or would like to do them differently than the way the workflow prescribed. And rather than that being a problem, um, and this theory is based on, act, and Michael Adams linked this to ultimately to activity theory, rather than to see that as a problem, it's seen as a learning experience. So basically over time, you, you, 
to increase your repertoire for doing things. So that's the idea of worklets that you can, when you, when you reach a task, depending on the context, you can do the task a certain way and, and you can extend that over time. And excellence are, yeah, excellence are varying, uh, various uh, exceptional circumstances that you may encounter. For example, uh, timeout or a resource may not be available. And then you may also have different ways of, of dealing with that. And again, that can be a repertoire too that extends over time. I think that's uh, extremely powerful. And once you have known that it's there, you cannot imagine not having it. You know, it's. I think it's one of the uh, most important features. I mean. Uh, uh, I, you, you talked about declarative languages. That's also interesting. Um, I have seen that there has been something implemented in YAWL and, and um, declarative process mining, for example, is still a, a very active research topic. So um, uh, uh, maybe that's something that, you know, should be picked up in the future for, for, for the development of YAWL. Um, to, to, to go into this declarative uh, direction and maybe combine it with with imperative um, process modeling because the declarative... So, so th th that, that, that work has been, um, there is this work around flexibility as a service. I th for memory, that was published in 2009 and that involved, um, uh, so, so it involved Maya Pesic and, and Michael Adams, I think Helen Schoenberg as well, and Mike and Will and myself. And that idea was that you can combine these ideas of worklets and declarative workflow, for example, depending on your, on your flexibility needs. So within a declarative workflow, you can have work, worklets, for example. Um, so that, that, that combination provides you with a very powerful way of, uh, of dealing with circumstances that demand flexibility. So some work has been done in that, in that space. Yeah. Um, what, are, what have been the, the obstacles of getting there where we are now on the way to you know for, for developing your all, over all this long period of time yeah there are all of it they're, they're different they're, you can look at it in different ways you, you can uh, approach this from a resourcing point of view like uh, it has not been easy over time of course to to attract the funding to do the work and to keep the people that uh, of course they build up a lot of uh, experience ha have built up a lot of experience with the environment so like for example a, an early developer of the oil engine Lachlan L. Aldred yeah, he went to industry and you have to replace him and luckily we had Michael Adams but you, these challenges of resources within a fairly resource constrained setting uh, are not easy to deal with, and especially not over a longer period of time. So to get the right people working on it, but also to have the money to, to pay them. Um, and that links to uh, you being able typically to get grants uh, to support the, these people. So I would say that is one line of challenges to keep uh, the development going and, um, and you have to keep the maintenance of it going as well. That is, that is definitely uh, uh, challenging. Then you have a bit the, almost like the promotional side of things. Um, how do you make the community aware of the work that you've done? I, I felt personally at one stage that we offered a lot of capability and I wasn't so sure that, that we uh, necessarily communicated that well or that the community was so aware of what the environment could do. Um, and you have been a great advocate of the environment and, and through the videos that you've produced, you can see the, the, the wide range of capabilities that the YOL environment offered, uh, offers. But um, yeah, that, that, that was, uh, I'd say that was a challenge to promote this and to get visibility because of course there are competing efforts uh, in, the, in this space. Um, another challenge is a bit, um, I would say around when you have an open source environment, it's sometimes difficult to, um, um, to, to, to know who is using your environment and for what purposes. And that's interesting for us because if we have success stories, for example, uh, then we can use that in grant applications and then we can, can have a story around the impact of our environment. Um, but yeah, the nature of open source is people can use it and they don't necessarily have to tell you about it. I, I understand that. Uh, but it would be great if there are success, uh, success stories out there to know of them. 
Um, so that is, I would say that's another challenge um, that you have a bit more insight into what the success stories are or, or the opposite, right? Uh, that people have considered you all and basically decided against using it. Then it would be great to know what the reasons, uh, what the reasons are. I agree. I mean, uh, you talk about that, I mean, uh, the uptake and how many times has y'all been downloaded so far? Yeah, so since we moved from, uh, well, since we moved to the new uh, uh, environment, uh, uh, GitHub uh, at the moment is what we're using. We lost a little bit track of exactly the, the number of downloads, but uh, based on, uh, on information that uh, that, that uh, um, I think uh, Michael Adams provided me, um, I would estimate it to be around 300,000 uh, downloads. That's an impressive number. Um, what is the, What about the citation count? Because you, you have written many... Um, uh, scientific articles and um, do you know um, um, the, the citation count there I mean does does did y'all have any impact on that is there any correlation between articles that are on y'all and articles that are not on y'all or something like that I'm not sure I can answer that second part but I can certainly say that um, the YAL paper on, on the main YAL paper, which appeared in Information Systems in 2005, um, according to Google Scholar, was cited um, as of today 2,145 times. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a highly cited paper. If you go to Scopus, which is a bit more conservative in how it counts its citations, it was 1,006 today. And it, that makes the YAL paper the second most cited paper that appeared in that journal. So, um, yeah, that, that I would say that was highly uh, influential in that sense. Uh, papers such as the uh, the worklet paper on, on um, Google Scholar was 359 citations and Exlet uh, 148. Yeah, so it's 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 good to know that. I, I think that um, you know um, data publication is one of the the topics, and I, I think articles that publish their data. Uh, seem to be more successful than articles that don't publish their data nowadays, at least. And um, you know, articles that publish their 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 system. I mean, that, this is something that is comparable in the end. So um, I was really um, um, thinking that you know, you, you talked about these difficulties of funding something like that. Um, that in other disciplines, when when you look at physicists, for example, so they have their big synchrotrons, or or the engineers, they have their big halls with lots of expensive machines. And in computer science, it seems that there is no such equivalent. Um, it, it always seems to me that uh, because computer science comes from mathematics, that people think that you you can do it essentially with a pencil and a piece of paper, you know, and and th that there, there isn't this awareness that you need, you know, virtual laboratories. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I think I think Will may have mentioned this to me at one stage as well. That it, it's very hard to get grant funding to maintain pieces of software. So these we have a, a number of open source initiatives apart from YAL, with things like Prom, etc., and, uh, and and others. Um, th these these open source initiatives contribute, in my view, greatly to the progress in the field. Um, but they are, um, yeah, they are expensive to maintain and, and well, to, and to build, of course. Um, so, yeah, you, you're completely right. You don't find an equivalent attitude towards these artifacts as you find in uh, the more tangible artifacts in the physical sciences, for example. Yeah, that's a problem, I think. Um, what have been the recent extensions in, uh, in YAWL to the YAWL system or the YAWL language? Yeah, this, I, I can name three extensions that come to mind now. Uh, one around uh, uh, what we call BPM in the cloud. So um, how would you need to, uh, off, what would you need to do in order to, for your workflow management system to run in a cloud environment? And how can you do load balancing, for example, in such a setting? That was some work we did recently. Um, then there is some work around um, blockchain. So uh, there's a blockchain service in YOL that, uh, that Michael Adams developed. Um, yeah, I would, I would love to see some, some people applying that and, and give us feedback on that. It's a more uh, lightweight approach than what you see uh, uh, proposed in the literature. Um, then another one is work, Andreas, that you were involved in as well with Michael Adams around uh, various ontological views. So the idea that we can define various views on specifications. Um, 
And uh, yeah, that was also recently published. I think that was also a very interesting uh, addition. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. What, what about uh, the future? I mean, are there any um, extensions or new features planned in the near future? Um, well, I, I know that Michael Adams has expressed to me recently that he he would like to uh, improve the interface of the of the environment uh, and update that a bit. Uh, that would be nice. Could be a bit of work, but it would be good. That's something that you regularly need to do for the environment to keep a kind of a modern look, which tends to change over time. Um, I would also, and, and this is a little bit of a dilemma that we we face sometimes, right? Uh, It would be good also to receive feedback on, on the sort of things that people would really like to see added to it, because yes, we can add to it. And from a research perspective, there are sometimes incentives to do so. And I, I, I gave some examples of that. But it'd be also nice from the community to hear as to what kind of things would be really important for them, what are perhaps deal breakers for them or, or really nice to have. Um, so, um, I think we need to move to because of the limited resources that we have to a fairly focused to fairly focused efforts in terms of extending your yeah I mean you're talking about uh, yeah uh, resources and uh, the whole idea of open source is of course that um, also people contribute who are not uh, you know um, not in the same um, uh, environment and and how How can people contribute to YAWL if they want to contribute? What about licensing and how does the process work? Yeah, so they can contribute in, I, I would say, in a variety of ways. Um, I, I think, of course, they can help us with the development of, of new components that can interact with the YAWL environment. Um, that's one way. Um, as you know, it has a service-oriented architecture, so met with, with many fairly rich interfaces, so any additions to that Uh, would be very welcome or of course if people find problems reporting them very helpful um, so becoming part of the development is, is one way um, applying you all in different settings and, and talking about that and reporting on that is also very helpful for us uh, it gives us insight into the practical application of the environment uh, contributing to well the education or or documentation of y'all, if you like, and various features. Like, I, I think the example of the various videos that you've made are an excellent excellent case of that. Um, um, I think um, that has provided a very, uh, yeah, very easily accessible and understandable way of the various features of y'all. Uh, that in itself is a great contribution, and, and people can do, can do uh, yeah, that also in their own ways. Um, Yeah, those was, are some things I can think about. Um, edu like education, I just mentioned. Yeah, of course, people using it in in educational settings. We've we've seen you all, you all being used in in many universities when when, for example, topics like process automation are being taught. I think that's very helpful. Again, that can give us insight uh, into um, yeah how how people perceive this. Ah, yeah. What, what is the role of the of the YAWL Foundation? I always thought that it was something about funding YAWL, but uh, maybe that's not the case. No, it, there's a bit of a, a technical reason behind the YAWL Foundation. And um, um, when we worked with uh, an in, the industry partner, First Utility, that I mentioned before, at one stage, of course, the question comes up, if you're going to rely on the YAWL environment, uh, you'll have to have some... Yeah, some guarantees, if you like, and uh, one of them is that everyone that contributed to the environment is happy to see their contributions released to the environment. Of course, you would be in a bit of strife if uh, someone later says, like, yeah, I wasn't, well, I developed this component, but I didn't mean for it to be released as part of the environment, right? So you want to take away that uncertainty. You want to make sure that people are happy that uh, their contributions become part of the environment. So that was one. And the other one was that, of course, you want to also have some guarantee that uh, there's some safeguards around that, that people didn't, let's say, steal their code from somewhere else. Uh, that, that is, uh, yeah, that would be most unfortunate if it then become, became part of the environment. So um, in a way, the YOL Foundation uh, and, and the, the agreement set up around that ask contributors um, yeah, for these two things. In, 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 uh, the, yeah, that, that's the most important, uh, the, those are the most important parts. Arthur, it's been a real pleasure having you here. 
Thank you for your insights into the world of YAWL. To those who have followed this video until here, thank you for watching. There will be more interviews to come in the future. See you soon.